you know, I mean, unless you're doing it for a living like we do, and what you put up there is going to be recorded and registered with a publisher and, and all of that stuff, uh, you know, chances are uh, nobody's going to know. And, um, and rather write a song that's a bit like somebody else's song and get yourself familiar with the craft than not write because you say, oh God, it sounds like glory or oh God, it sounds like stairway to heaven. You know? So, that, so that's, that's, a really, that's a really useful, useful thing. I mean, um, is there, have we got an example? For, for where for we... Something. Yeah. Well, I, th I think a, a great example for a really simple song structure that everyone's used is something like Not Your Heaven's Door. Because, I mean, sure, you could own up, you've got one. Yeah. Um, one more boring night, right? that's basically with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, and and I, I, I can't think of one I've got off the top of my head, but everyone's written a song there. You know, that sort of thing. I would, and that's all you need. You've got, and then, well, the, typically, you've got two couplets followed by two couplets, and the last line being your repeated hook, generally. And then that's one way of writing a song. Four lines repeated, your last lines keep restating your hook and over a simple chord progression. That's not a bad way of doing it. We did, um, a, a couple of year, years ago, we got engaged to do some songwriting workshops on men's getaway weekends with the victims of the bush bushfire uh, up in um, Victoria. And Hugh and I worked together, we've been, you know, like married for a hundred years, but we've never actually written a song together with a group of blokes who really wanted to write a song in a weekend. It was pretty hard. So what we did was we we got them and we asked them, you know, because they all had their instruments, and we said, okay, well, you, you've probably got a, a favourite chord progression that you've been mucking around with that you haven't shared with anybody, you know? And everybody had one. So we, so we went around and we listened to each one, and then we voted on the one that we were going to use to build the song from. Uh, and that worked. Well, what's that? What's, what's that? That. Um, <coughs> do you remember how that the wind was called? Um, it wasn't overly memorable, but okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but then then once we got that, we we had. This is how I do it anyway. I, I just get a like a like a, a chord progression that pleases my ear, that I can sing a melody across that. I don't remember having been written by anyone else. And then we tease the song out at either, or I tease the song out at either end. I'll get a, um, I'll get a um, uh, sort of a line, a hook line, and I'll sort of like tease it out like plasticine, get it as long as I can until it breaks. Um, I, let me anticipate a question here. Is it the chicken or the egg? What yeah, comes first, there is is the music or the... Or, or the lyric. So I think it can be it can be either. For me, you for me, it's usually not the entire lyric, but it'll be a subject, and I'll get a line that resonates in, in me. You know, the rain never falls on the dusty diamantina or something, and you know, it it, it resonates. I, I think, oh, shoot, that's really kind of romantic. And then I'll start doodling on the guitar and singing, really, doodling, singing, just singing anything uh -huh. over these this little fragment of words yeah. and I'll try and make a melody and I think this is very important not to just strum a chord, some chords and, and and then just have um, have your melody taking the line of least resistance between the chords so I think it, it, it's helpful and instructive to try and make your chord, your melody have a contour it's nice if it goes up and down the best melodies you know, that we ever hear you know, songs like Autumn Leaves. We all heard Autumn Leaves. Beautiful contour. You can see it in your mind and those things are, 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 are me memorable. Or if you hear, hear Yesterday by McCartney, you know, it's this amazing contour. It's, it's satisfying. It takes you up and down in the right places. It takes you up and then releases the tension and you feel this wonderful sense of conclusion at the end of it. And you can see it in your mind. It's a, there's a visual contour. Flatline melodies Boring, you know. If you don't, you know, if you don't write music, and I mean, Hugh 
writes a bit more than I do. I have no idea. I've got no idea what I'm doing. I swear to God, you know, I, it, I, it's, it is it is a case where, you know, like Hugh and I have worked together for ages and ages, and I'll come to him with a song pretty well worked out, you know, and I'll put my capo on because that's where it, you know, that's that gives me the chord shapes that I know that I'm comfortable with and the range that's okay for my voice. I got to ask Hugh what key I'm in, so that's how little I know about it, you know. But you know, I've got to tell you. Uh, not that it's a me measure of anything particularly, but I've got a stack of gold and platinum records and awards from all over the place, which demonstrates that it doesn't matter if you read or write mu music at all. It's what, if, if, if the music, you know, if the melody rises and falls and the, the lyric is engaging and real and people can grab hold of it and it have e empathy and understand it if it moves them, then you're halfway to the Sammy finals without dropping a set, you know. So how do you how do you hold on to your melody? Ah, uh, there's a good you question. Record, you record yourself endlessly, or uh, by the time for me, by the time I come to record it with you, I've done it so many times that it's in my head. You know, I've got it. Okay, so I don't have to. It's like people say to me, "How do you remember all those lyrics?" Well, I don't have to remember them because I wrote them. You know, so when you're they writing, just when you're writing something new. Yeah. It's the old thing you, you wake up just playing a hot or you've done your day's work or like yeah. so how do you hold up your world? Just in you just in my head. I, oh no actually that's not well you know in the old days I would hold on to it. Yeah. I've got a I've got a little um, little uh, a digital four track that I can hardly use because um, the manual's about that thick and it's written in Chinglish. Um, and and uh, so but I've got I, I can use it enough to be able to get my get the, the 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 chord progression and the melody in the microphone down. The other thing that I do, um, you know, if I'm if I have to write a song, and um, you know, and I don't know where to start, I, I won't I won't go as far as Neil Finn, but I will pick a song with a really nice feel, a really nice a really nice groove, you know, a really nice sort of drum beat, you know, and a nice tempo and everything. I'm, wow, I'd like to write a song across that drum beat and I will, I've got a little drum machine, once again, a pretty simple old one that I can use and I can program that and then I just play that over and over again and I play my guitar up and down until, until something interesting happens. Um, it's, if, I mean, if, if we could sit here and say to you, you know, here is a foolproof formula for writing a song, we'd do it. Um, we would have done it ourselves. We would have done it ourselves. <laughs> they wouldn't be we telling us. We wouldn't have had the, uh, the bottom drawer full of shit. If you know. I sort of have an emotion happening with a lyric and a, an idea. I sort of, that's what, that's what I normally get, an emotion. Yeah, so I'll know, that's, that's you know, exactly what I get. Yeah, an emotion. And then I'll pick a song that sort of suits that and then I'll steal as much of it as I can. Yeah, I, I well, not really, but I, I don't. Like I don't have an emotion so much. I mean, I'll get, I'll get ideas. I mean, I don't know whether you were there the first night. Um, we uh, we um, play with the first song we did was a song called Borrowed Ground, um, yeah. which was the first song I released after I left Red Gun. Now, the story behind that song is is really simple, but I think quite instructive. Um, it was during the. It was in the. It was in the 80s. Uh, uh, the, the the late eight, 80s. There was a rural crisis on. I actually didn't have a job because I'd left Red Gum to be a house husband. My wife was going out to work as a teacher. We bought a house. Um, you know, well, we got a deposit on a house based on some royalties I got from you know some songs, which was great. So we got into the market, but then interest rates went through the roof they were up to the 15 16 percent and i had uh i had uh, a little boy a mortgage no job and my missus was going out to work and she had a bun in the oven as well so it was pretty scary and what i was really frightened of i was really absolutely frightened that i was gonna you know that we were going to lose the house and not be able to maintain the mortgage now as it happened you know as you generally speak and do you know you're smart and you know a few people and you, you know you can get through and we got through it okay but it was really tough and I so when I wrote Borrowed Ground I was writing it from the point of view of somebody who had lost their house because I had as a song writer I had already imagined it I'd already been there in my head with the truck in the driveway and all our stuff going out I'd lived it I'd lived that 
you know, because these interest rates were going up. It was scary time, was, and we were a young family. Um, so when I watched this television pro program about this farming family from Forbes getting dragged off their land by the bank, and you know, the, the bailiffs dragged the father out, and there was a, this amazing, horrible, emotional shot about a trike, kids' trike, upended on the lawn, you know? My, my heart bled, I was in tears, and I really sat down and wrote Borrowed Ground in 10 minutes, um, because I was actually there in my head, I was with these people, I'd lived it all, and I just watched this, 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 um, this thing happen, and I remember I sat down and I, I, it, was a, it was a three chord wonder again, and I was just going, uh, um, and suddenly this whole thing came tumbling out. I don't know where from, but I think that I'd been cooking it on the ba on the back burner of the stove with the lid on for quite some time, and suddenly I just took the lid off and shit, there's a song. But it really was, you know, the idea was, you know, I bled for this family. I got it. I understood it. I got the heartbreak in, you know. And when I wrote it, and and, and Mal, uh, who played the piano, who plays the piano with, with us, he was the one who played that little, um, the little um, piano bit. And that's the other thing, you know, if you if you work with somebody else that you absolutely love and trust and you can give your song to them and they can say, Shui, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? I mean, he and I do that all the time, you know? Um, and then, Question, you know, then you're halfway you through it. Hey? <laughs> if, you find somebody, if you find somebody you love and trust, they don't exist. Them so far. <laughs> <Yeah>. Marry them. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, and I don't, I, I, I just remember that that evening, you know, as, as clear as a bell. I sort of went, television was there, my guitar was there, I went and sat at the kitchen table and I wrote Borrowed Ground. Um, and as I said, it was really about all my fears wrapped up into one. And that thing where it goes, you know, and I went, and I went, and I watch all the programs on the ABC uh, after the sun's gone down. Lucy Broad's talking on Countrywide, talking about borrowed ground. We don't own this place anymore, and I don't know how or why. There's some money men coming from Sydney who tell me it's only a matter of time. Well, I hope they can read the seasons, and they're not here just to muck around. Because they still have to feed a nation. They gotta feed him from borrowed ground. It was just a borrowed ground, and um, there it was, and and that that little tale that we sing, you know, um, living on borrowed ground, and the overdraft won't come down. I mean, that was me because we had an overdraft that the bank had got us, and it was just it was just like stuck there like concrete, you know, and we couldn't do anything about it. We just worked hard and lived simply, and you know, then. <coughs> That's where the best songs come from. Those, those sort of I mean, Huey's, Huey's Spirit of the Land, um, which is, uh, he wrote about his, his, his community in Kew, is the same thing, isn't it? Correct. 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 Kew's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he, yeah, he, he and I. The we, mortgage we, is a <coughs> bigger, the overdraft's probably smaller. <laughs> we, 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 have to, we have to confess, um, you know, he's got a really lovely house in Kew. Don't tell him that. He does not. He's got a lovely house in Kew, and I've got a pretty reasonable house in College Park, which is the leafy one of the leafy inner suburban areas of Adelaide. And the fact is that 35 years ago, we used to write songs about people like us. <laughs> <laughs> then we married brilliant women who were amazing. Fun. All I ever had to do was work. All I had to do was earn it. I had this amazing creature that kind of made it work into a house. <laughs> <laughs> but, but tell them about Spirit of the Land, because yeah. I think that's, a, that's a, a, a really good example. Is this helpful? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Or every song I've written just about is about, is about my childhood in Kerrang. All, all the um, images are drawn from my childhood, all, all the really important feelings 
within the songs come from my childhood growing up in a small, close-knit rural community where they were subject to, to floods, droughts and bushfires and all the, all the unforeseen weather events which make it hard for country people. And with Spirit of the Land, I just, I really wanted to, to say how much I felt about that community, how much, how much I loved those people. And, and there was this, this spirit that they all seemed to be imbued with that I just called the spirit of the land. It's a cliche, I've heard it before, but it didn't matter. It, you know, I haven't heard it that many times before, so you know, it's okay. And it, it, it seemed to sum it, sum it up for me. And the rest of the song is details. I, I set it up by talking about the landscape and the weather, I think, and then I bring in, introduce a character who, called Hank the Dutchman, who was a, a fellow called Hank Freeling, whose father had come out here from Holland after the Second World War. They were Holocaust, he was a Holocaust survivor and uh, he used to play the guitar. He played a mate on guitar and one of the really early mate on guitars and they had a little dance band around and it was just this, they come from all kinds of adversity and yet kept the smile on their face and you know the drought, droughts and the floods and the bushfires and so I, I wrote a verse about him but he also was struggling through the droughts and he ended up selling I don't know whether anyone's heard of Rawley's products, but they were, yeah, yeah. yeah and so these were really old fashioned products and he was trying to make a quid out of that and, and at the same time the supermarkets had just come to Kerrang and so he wasn't making a quid out of that because they were, they were, everyone was going to the supermarkets. So he, he filled up with details which I think advanced his story. And we should see that. But, yeah, but if, oh, let me just, I think for, if, if you want to, um, <coughs> learn to write songs if you want to if you want to improve your songwriting there's a few things in both what John just said and what I said about the detail and how you interrogate your subject what questions you ask of your subject to um, to provide you with detail it's got to be relevant but you, you, you come up with a lot more detail but you've got to ask a number of questions of your subject you, you, you've got to invoke all your senses sights you know what do you see what do you hear? What do you smell? What do you touch? What do you feel? So, so you can get that out. Yeah, they're, they're all like they're very straight, technical aspects of, of how you interrogate a subject. That's like I remember at primary school being asked to ask the why question, the W questions of your subject: what, who, where, when, why, all those sorts of things. Because you've got to provide yourself with subject. The song's not going to pop out of thin air. You do have to go through an intellectual process to, to um, find your list of little lines and little um, observations from which you choose. And so the more fertile you can make that ground, the better. And the other, oh, the, uh, I, I just want to mention, when you tell a story, at some stage, if you keep kind of hammering the same point, it's going to get boring. And so many songs have a thing called a bridge or a middle eight. And lyrically, it's looking at the subject through another set of eyes maybe, or from another perspective. And um, John's uh, in Borrowed Ground, I, I, you know, I'm not an expert on Borrowed Ground, I kind of let the lyric flow past me, but what I, I hear is he's telling and you I the story. So hard on. <laughs> <laughs> he's told you the story in the verse, he's told you how he felt, but then he goes, to shift perspective, takes the camera back to the ABC and some pompous bitch on the ABC who knows nothing about the farm, you know. And, and so you've got this different, did I say that? It sounds very unkind. <laughs> you are unkind. I can be indelicate, but you I hope you get my well. point. But, so you get this different perspective. And that, that is generally the purpose of a middle eight, in my experience. Do you like a bridge and a song? That's a bridge. You like to write a bridge? Yeah, I, I love bridges because it gets, it gets you away from the, uh, it gets you away from the, um, from the monotony, yeah. it, it's like the it's like a classic essay, isn't it? You know, your introduction. You tell them what you're going to tell them. Yeah. You tell them, you tell them what you told them, and you tell them what you told them in a in a different way. I mean, there's two things that you said, and I just you know, if I could just interrupt. Yeah, carry on. The detail. Okay. Um, I did a, 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 a I do from time to time um, lecture guest lectures and seminars at university in Australian lit and poetry. Okay. Um, and a guy introduced me once and he said something that really opened my eyes to what we do, what I do, and specifically he said, here's this guy who's written all these songs and you, 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 know, you know you'll hear him, yada yada yada, blah blah, whack whack whack. And then he said, the thing about this guy, I want you to listen to what he's got to say, listen to the, his songs. When you look at them, his, his songs are chock full of detail. 
and it's the detail, it, it, this, these are the words again, it's the detail that is the signpost to what the song means. It's the detail that makes it real. It's the detail that points to what where the song what the song means. And if you listen to you song, which we might do, we might do Spirit of the Land, because um, that's a, that's a really